Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning at Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are here and thank you for coming. As you can see today is a special day. We are having the choir is back. So I have been looking forward to this and I'm grateful for their presence and the way that they will lead us in worship. And also this is a special Sunday because we are having concurrent worship services. The traditional and the nine o'clock service will be going on at the same time. Our acolytes are back. And so slowly we're trying to find ways during this time of transition to come together to do what we can until things change. As attendance grows, we will eventually get to a place where there is more diversity of time in our worshiping, but for now, this is the best way we can worship together during this period of time where perhaps half of us are still online. So to those of you online, welcome to worship. We are glad that you are here among us. We count you as part of the faithful as you worship in your space, and we pray God's grace and mercy upon you as well. I'm Pastor Dottie Escobedo Frank, and Reverend Brenda will be helping us in worship today. And the choir, now let us begin to worship. Let us begin worship with a prayer from Psalm 34, verse 8. Let's pray together. We come to church hungry, Lord. We are hungry for comfort, hungry for love, hungry for a new way of living, hungry for your word. Thank you for giving us this place and this time to worship and we are eager to taste your goodness. Amen. With our brothers and sisters, be near us, O oh God, and fill our hunger for you. Amen.
Good morning. It is so good to see you all this morning. Will you join me as we do the opening prayer? Almighty God, we are your people, and you are our God. We gather to worship you with all that we are. From you, Lord, no secrets are hidden. So cleanse our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may follow you more holy and serve you more fully. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Kids, join me up front, please. All right, good morning, everybody. Did you all enjoy your short week at school? It's good. Was it a three-day weekend or a four-day weekend? Oh, four-day weekends. We need more of those, Pastor Dottie. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually really excited today because I brought some seeds in, and I love being able to plant things because then in the spring, we'll have all kinds of flowers. Everett, do you want to sit by me? So if I went out to the church parking lot, I think that'd be a great place to spread all of these seeds so that I can share with everybody. And I just went out there and just threw them all over. Would that be a good way to plant them? No? Why not? Well, because then they won't be in the ground. You just go and not. All right, yeah. So I must, I'm just not a really good gardener. What if I use my coffee cup? Coffee gives me a great kickstart in the morning. Do you think it'll help kickstart the flowers? No, why not? Not enough soil. So what do we need for flowers to grow really well? Um, sun, uh, water, and soil. 
Good water, good soil. Anything else that we need for plants? Jade? Earth. Yes, we need earth. Belly. Sunlight. Sunlight. Yeah, those are all really good things. And the same way that we get our flowers to grow, God wants us to have healthy and strong churches too. So I'm going to say a few things, and I want you to raise your hand if you think it's something that will help with a healthy and strong church. So if our church is somewhere that we want to invite our friends to, would that be a healthy church? So raise your hand if you think that's a good thing. If we have a church that nobody says good morning to each other, would that be a healthy and strong church? No. What if we have a church that it's really a nice place to take a nap? Maybe both? Maybe. Maybe it's a good place because then it's a safe space that we can be. And then what? Do any of you have any other ideas? What would might make a healthy and strong church? Any ideas? Yeah, Ellie. Oh, where we pray to God. What about a church where it's okay to read the Bible together and ask questions? Yeah, that's a good thing. A church where everybody gets along. Yeah, that's a great thing. And I think those are things that would make God really happy if it's a place where we all get along and can pray together and read the Bible together and praise the Lord and invite friends and family. So let's pray together, friends. And let's repeat after me. Dear God, Thank you for hearing us, for being with us, and for helping us grow in faith. Amen. All right, let's head over to Sunday school. We'll head to the back of the church in the narthex. <laughs> Always value the wisdom of our children when they speak, right? It's wonderful. It's uh, time for our prayer, and I invite you to join me as we do the prayer of confession together. Save my soul, good gardener, evil flies and wanting to steal my hope. Work piles up, insecure boulders ready to crash, leaving no room to root. My faith begins to wither, as does our relationship. Distractions grow, choking my gratitude, my perspective, my spirit. Guard us, guide us, deliver us, clear the land, weed then seed, nourish the soul of our souls, that we blossom and bring forth the fruit a hundredfold. Please continue with me as we pray. Jesus, you are the true vine, and God is the gardener. Cut off every branch in us that bears no fruit, and every branch and seed that does bear fruit, it is because you are the lifeline. You know what we are each capable of producing. Embolden us to bear the eternal fruit of your spirit which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, because we need your spirit every hour. This weekend, we painfully remember the great tragedy of September 11th, 2001. It reminds us of what people are capable of doing when evil and oppression are allowed to rule. It also reminds us of the brevity and uncertainty of life. Bring comfort to all who mourn. Guide all our healing into goodness. And let and lead us to comfort one another and be gracious. We look to you, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the God of our universe, who created a diverse world of many nations and tongues. Help us to learn from our mistakes, to choose love as the master of our lives, to practice forgiveness, to not let anger hold us and to allow our hearts to see the beauty and sacredness in every living thing, especially humanity. Thank you for your continual presence showing us the way to be in this world with you as our strength and hope. May everyone come to know you. 
We continue to ask for your wisdom in the midst of this long struggle with COVID-19 and its variants. The impact has been devastating to the whole world. Use this virus to bring about cooperation of knowledge across this planet so that all may be healed. Lead us into a recovery that restores and promotes needed change. We celebrate National Grandparents Day today. Thank you for the wisdom, patience, and love they bring to our lives. We ask that you bless each one here and those in our hearts. And for our church, we want to be part of your garden where good soil is provided and healthy seeds are planted. So we ask for you to nourish this place with your Holy Spirit, prune us when we need it, bless us to do good works and to share the good news. As we lift our voices together to pray the prayer that you taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into the offering time, I invite the ushers to prepare for this time of tithes and offerings. You may also give by searching on your phone, pvumc.life, and you can also go to the website, pvumc.org, give now. Your giving is what helps the church be the church. We celebrate family camp this last weekend. Uh, we used to do one annually, even before my time here. So we're just so glad that that has come back. We're grateful that we can help Haiti, right? The country of Haiti, that's what our church does too in our bigger picture of reaching out with our offerings. This is a very active church with many ministries because of your generosity. And more importantly, there's coffee and donuts right after the service, so uh, direct impact there. Hope you join us. Thank you so much.
you join me as we say a prayer over our offering? All that we have is yours, loving Lord. Take our gifts of money, time, talent, gifts, service, and presence, and use them for the good of your kingdom on earth and the kingdom to come. In Christ, amen. I invite you to listen for the word of God from the Gospel of Luke. When a great crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from one city after another, he spoke to them in a parable. A farmer went out to scatter his seed. As he was scattering it, some fell on the path where it was crushed and the birds in the sky came and ate it. Other seed fell on rock. As it grew, it dried up because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorns grew with the plants and choked them. Still other seed landed on good soil. When it grew, it produced 100 times more grain than was scattered. As he said this, he called out, everyone who has ears should pay attention. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, you have been given the mysteries of God's kingdom, but these mysteries come to everyone else in parables so that when they see, they can't see, and when they hear, they can't understand. The parable means this. The seed is God's word. The seed on the path are those who hear, but then the devil comes and steals the word from their hearts so that they won't believe and be saved. The seed on the rock are those who receive the word joyfully when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but fall away when they are tempted. As for the seed that fell among thorny plants, these are the ones who, as they go about their lives, are choked by concerns, riches, and pleasures of life, and their fruit never matures. The seed that fell on good soil are those who hear the word and commit themselves to it with a good and upright heart. Through their resolve, they bear fruit. We are grateful for the ways that uh, many voices add to our worship service, and I am also grateful for the, the children to be among us and to hear their wisdom. And uh, when Kristen asked about uh, falling asleep in church, uh, I rem remembered my professor of preaching who said, you know, preaching, it's not about you, so there will be people who fall asleep in church while you're preaching. And he said to us, count that as a blessing, because if they need sleep and they find peace in the sanctuary that, is, that you preside at, then know that that peace matters so much more than your words. <laughs> And so, have at it. If you need a nap, I'm okay. <laughs> so today we begin a new series called Feast. And it, it's about the fact that we, we all are invited to God's feast, God's table. But that sometimes we arrive at this table still hungry. So in this series, we're going to look at some of the messages out of the parables in Luke. And we are going to look at the hungers that we have as humans and the changes we need to make in order to have our hungers filled and how to feast at the table of God. And this first week, we are looking at the hunger that plagues society, the hunger to be awakened. So in case you're wondering if your life matters, then this, this week is for you. You see, sometimes I, I think we live a half-life. What I mean is that we have this idea in our heads, this dream, this vision of what our lives should be about, but we leave ourselves hungry, hungry to be awakened to that life that God dreamed for us that we in turn dream back to God. And so to be awake is to live our lives fully alive, to work out our purpose on this earth, to, 
be so connected with God that we are energized and that we are engaged for living the life that God created for us. And we get hungry, hungry for God, when we are not living that life that is awake and full of meaning and significance. So I thought about that this week. Every time I preach, I go through this week-long dirge into my own soul. (laughs) Because uh, another thing that same preaching professor told us is if it doesn't if you can't preach to yourself, then you're not going to be a very good preacher to other people. So first, look inside of yourself. So I did that. I looked at some of the ways that I wasn't living up to my potential, that I was living a half-life in different periods in my life that I could see I wasn't fully awake to what God was doing in me. And it, it took me to a place where I, I just felt sad and asked God to help me with that. And uh, I wanted to tell you all about that, but then I decided, nope, not yet. (laughs) Instead, I'm going to tell you about Cecilia. She is a real person that I met quite quite a while back. She's tall, gorgeous, smart woman who excels at work. And her boss continued to respect the work that she did and promote her within her work setting because he could trust her with the responsibilities that he handed to her. And she came to, to church, that's where I met her, because, because uh, she loved music and because her mama loved to sing. So she would come and bring her mom to church with her. And every once in a while, her mom would sing at church as she sang at different ven- venues across the valley. But Cecilia was there to support and assist her mom. So. The problem was that Cecilia had another thing going on that I had no idea about, and that was that nighttime Cecilia was doing drugs with her friends. And she found herself in the clutches of this drug and unable to set herself free. I didn't know all that. But one day as I was leaving church, I saw her out in the parking lot sitting in her car crying. And so I approached her car, and I said, Cecilia, what's going on? And in embarrassment, she turned her face away from me like she didn't want to let me know. But then she said, here, come, come sit with me. And we talked. And she said, Pastor, I'm such a mess. My life is a mess. I was surprised because in my view of her life, she looked like she had it all together. And she said that she was using drugs and that she couldn't stop. And she said that she had a boyfriend who couldn't commit to her, and they'd been going together a long, 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 long time. And she said there was a part of her life that she was hiding from the world. And so when I saw Cecilia and I saw this put-together woman who seemed strong and full of, of intelligence and life, what I didn't know that was that there was even more to Cecilia and that she was only living half of her life. The other half was being hidden. After we talked, she said, Pastor, would you just just pray for me? That's all I need. I know the steps I need to take, but I need help. I need prayer. So we prayed right there in the parking lot. And over the next few months, we talked to each other. And I checked in with her. How are you doing? Where are you at? How can I pray? And Cecilia was living this life that was half dead to the world, and yet she worried always about what others needed from her, what her mother needed from her, what her boyfriend needed from her, what her work needed from her. She forgot to consider how she could live fully alive, just understanding how she was connected to God, and that she could forget about everybody else's needs for her. Howard Thurman, the great theologian, says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Rabbi Amy Jill Levine states um, that parables are mysterious and difficult. And in this series, we are looking at a a set of parables. And so she says, Parables are mysterious and difficult, and that's because they challenge us to look into the hidden aspects of our own values and our own lives. They bring to the surface unasked questions. 
They reveal the answers we have always known but refuse to acknowledge. I think that uh, religion has often been said as an avenue to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Parables are there to afflict the comfortable. So if we take this parable seriously today, uh, we might kind of sit up and uh, not be so comfortable in our seats. We might be squirming in our seats, or we might feel some pit of our stomach churning if we take this parable seriously. Now, if we say instead, I really like this parable, we, we are actually saying that we didn't take it seriously. We just read it at a surface level. We didn't let it apply to our own lives. And, and that we actually got it wrong, which is why in the first part of the scripture, Jesus says, you know, here's the parable, and then he goes to the disciples and says, for those of you who really want to know what it means, here's what it means. And that there will many, be many people who want to hear the parables, oh, that's a nice story, but they don't get what it means, and they don't apply it to their lives, and they will have a different outcome because they haven't done the deep work of applying the parables to their lives. Uh, parables are like a magnifying glass that we put up to the microscopic problems of our life, those problems that we easily brush off. So Rabbi Amy says, parables remind, provoke, refine, confront, and disturb. So I hope you're feeling just a little bit uncomfortable right now as we look at this parable. And I want to read it out of a different version there's a version called The Voice New Testament, and it's a dramatic reading of the New Testament. So in this, The Voice, it says of this parable, the voice of God falls on human hearts like seeds scattered across a field. Some people hear that message, but the devil opposes the liberation that would come to them by believing. So he swoops in and steals the message from their hard hearts like birds stealing seeds from the footpath. Others receive the message enthusiastically, but their vitality is short-lived because the message cannot be deeply rooted in their shallow hearts. In the heat of temptation, their faith withers like the seeds that are sprouted on gravelly soil. A third group hears the message, but as time passes, the daily activities, the pursuit of wealth, and life's addicting delights outpace the growth of the message in their hearts. Even if the message blossoms and fruit begins to form, that fruit never fully matures because the thorns choke out the plant's vitality. But some people hear the message and take it root deeply in the receptive hearts made fertile by honesty and goodness. With patient dependability, they bear good fruit. So if you look at Jesus' explanation of this parable. He says to his disciples when they ask, well, what did that mean? He says, well, the seed is God's word to us. So God speaks to us in many ways. God speaks to us through the scriptures, through messages whispered into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, through dreams and visions, through through encouraging words from other people, through wise words from people that you trust. All those are ways that God's word gets implanted into our hearts. And then Jesus said the seed on the path is when we ignore the gift that was given to us, the gift of grace and the gift of salvation. When we ignore it but choose not to pay attention to it, then we have developed a hardened heart. So if we were to take this parable seriously, we would need to ask, where have we ignored God's message in our lives? Now, the seed on, on the rock, Jesus says, is those times when we get excited about God, but it's, it's temporary, and enthusiasm fades. We don't go deep, and God is just a fad. We have no roots, and so when things get difficult in our life, we just set God aside and say, well, that didn't work. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, when have we lost interest in listening to God? Now, Jesus explains the seed among the thorny plants. That's when we hear and receive the word, but the seed, God's word, is crowded out. 
We don't let that word change our lives because we are too concerned about tomorrow or about making money or about having fun. And God's voice is choked out with worries or riches or pleasures. So when have we been so concerned in our lives about tomorrow, worried about tomorrow, or about our finances, or about just having pleasure? And when did we allow those things to take away our time with God? And then Jesus says, well, the seed on good soil that's when our hearts are good, when we grab onto God's word and we hold on to it no matter what is happening in our lives. And even if it's difficult, we just with patience hold on and allow God's word to bear fruit in our lives. So where are the moments when you knew that God was saying to you, do this or go this way? And you follow God's instruction and it made all the difference in your life. That was seed on good soil. Okay, so that's the parable. Three things that we should consider not doing, one thing we should do. So how about you? Has your heart been hardened? H have you gone through something in your life that made you think that maybe God doesn't exist or that God doesn't care or I'm not going to pay attention to a God that allows this and this and this to happen. And so because of our limited intellectual understanding, we just say, I don't believe. Has your heart hardened? And where are the places that, that you need to go deeper with your faith? Where are the places where it would be easy for you to look like a Christian, but really, if anything difficult comes along, you won't sustain your faith because you'll just let that rocky soil be the deepest place that you go. Do you know that, that some plants, like, like grapes and vineyards, they actually plant them in rocky soil so that the, deep, the roots have to go deep, are forced to go deep. But if we put ourselves in rocky situations and we don't force ourselves to let the deep waters come into the root system of our lives, and then we stay shallow because shallow is easy and shallow doesn't require much of us and shallow is fun and shallow looks good. So where are the places where you need to go deeper? And where are the things, what are the things that we need to release so that we have room for God? Now, now they mentioned uh, the cares of the world, thinking about tomorrow, the, the financial worries that we have, and just the desire to have fun. Now, we do need to care about our finances, we do need to care about the world, and we do need to have fun. The parable isn't saying, stop all that. It's saying, don't make that the center of who you are, the center of who you are is that you are connected to God and to God's love and that that love and that faith in God will transform your life no matter what worries you have of yesterday, of today, or tomorrow. What are the things that in your life need to be released so that you have room for God? And the last thing Jesus said is, that there is a sweet soil of God's grace in our lives. There are times in our lives where we actually can feel the sweetness of God's grace, where, where we come to God with trusting and faithful hearts, and because of that, we watch the, the fruit grow in our lives. We watch our children, our grandchildren, our, our, our friends, our family, the people we work with, we watch their lives get better because we paid attention to what God was doing. I always wondered what happened to Cecilia. I left that church and I didn't know the end of the story. But she called me one day out of the blue when I was a couple churches down the road. I mean, a couple of assignments, appointments down the road. And asked me if I would attend her mother's funeral. And I did, and I sat down there with her for a moment after the memorial service was over. And 
I, I heard her tell me the rest of her story. She said that with God's help, her life had changed. The drug no longer controlled her. And when she told me that, her, light, her, her face lit up like, like a light. You could see that her light was being snuffed out before, even though she was, looked very competent. Now the light that shone in her was so much brighter. And she, she told me about the drug not having any effect on her anymore, that she just walked away from it. And she said she walked away from a controlling boyfriend, and she was free. She was still doing well at work, but she had more energy than she ever had before. And there was life in her, even as she grieved at her mother's funeral. And then much, much later, I heard from her next pastor that she was now one of the ones singing in church. That I didn't even know she had a singing voice, but that was being hidden. And now the fullness of who God created Cecilia to be was present to the world. She was no longer living a half-life. She was living fully who God made her to be. She was fully alive, fully awakened. You know, I think that in this parable, each one of us go through each of those phases at different times of our lives. So I want to help us remember when we have parables not to think, oh, but this parable is about my husband <laughs> or my sister. No, no, no. This parable is always about us. Jesus spoke these words so that we could learn, so that we could grow, so that we could live lives fully awakened and not allow things to get in the way. So people of God, be awakened today. Come alive for God's sake, plant your life in the soil of God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. All the good things that God gives us, plant your lives there. And trust that God is walking that path with you and bringing you to the place where you can be fully awake. God, thank you for the times that you stayed with us when we walked away from you. Thank you for believing in us when we didn't trust you. Thank you for giving us mercy when we were not forgiving of others. And thank you for always showing us a better way to live. And all God's people said, amen.
And so before you leave this place, just a couple of announcements. Serendipities, which is the gift shop here, is now open, so you can go there after, your, after the worship service. And we are bringing both worships, worship communities, the night service and this traditional service, together after the service for a fellowship moment. So if you'd like some donuts and coffee, um, go over to the fellowship hall area, and you can, um, we can mingle together there. And also, if you pay attention in your bulletin, there is an, an event coming up called Feed My Starving Children. If you'd like to be a part of that, the bulletin will show you how to engage in that arena. And now receive the blessing from God as you leave this place. Go from here knowing that God always goes with you. That wherever you are on the journey of your life, that God is there too. And open up your hearts to trust, to love, and to share God's love with those in your life. Because there are people around you who need to know God loves them. So be God's love and tell them of God's mercy. Do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.